coming out. It's a blessing to be here. I wanted to show that video because I think sometimes it's it's easy to come to a conference like this and uh, be desensitized, especially in a group like this. You know, you probably a lot of you go to churches. I hope where they're teaching the word. Sometimes I think we fail to realize the crucial nature and the attack on the Word of God and how important it is for us to build our life on the Word of God. Not long ago, um, I did a, just a little home Bible study just with my kids, basically, and the Atkinsons were over. And I was thinking during the day, knowing that this was coming up, I was thinking, well, what do I really want to talk about, you know? I mean, you got the whole Bible. There's a hundred things you can talk about. And I was thinking, if there's one thing that I would like to communicate to my family, the one thing I'd I'd want them to know, what would that be? And the Scripture came to mind, uh, Psalm 119, 162, where it says, I will rejoice at your word like one who finds great treasure. And I thought, if... If my kids could get a hold of that, if they can get their teeth on that, if they did that one thing, if they treasured God's Word, I'd I'd feel like pretty much there's nothing else to do. Why? If they treasured God's Word, they would hear from God. If they treasured God's Word, they would have a lamp unto their feet. If they treasured God's Word, they would know about eternity. They would know how to find eternal life. They would know how to live their life. They would know what life is all about. They would know a worldview from God's point of view. They would know what the world is all about. They would understand things, why things are happening. They would be able to put things in in perspective. and, And I would feel confident that they would be okay. And isn't that As a parent, what you want, you just want to know your kids will be okay. That, you know, no matter what happens to the parent, you know they'd be okay. And I would know that. If they treasured it, I would know that. This conference is is called the Effective Word. That's one thing that I've discovered and am, am discovering more and more is that that God's word really works. It really works. And you know, you come to a place, I don't know about all your stories, but a place in life where you're a Christian, and then you're kind of just trying to fumble your way through it, maybe in the early days of being a Christian, depending on if you grew up in the church or whatever. And once you really get serious about it, you're like, well, what do I do? And there's a natural progression for anybody who wants to get serious about their faith in Jesus Christ that they get serious about the Bible. And so God's given us this great treasure. If you have this great treasure, take it out. If you don't, there's one in one of the back of the seats there. Turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 22. Now, it's no it's no accident, it's no mistake that the Word of God is something that is in the crosshairs of Satan constantly. From the very beginning, Satan questioned God's Word, right? In the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? What we find as we read through Scripture is that God has a great desire to communicate to us. It's His will, it's His desire to communicate. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. He created man. He put man in the Garden of Eden. And and I believe there's a free flow of communication there. That was probably one of the great things about man and God in the Garden of Eden was was fellowship, right? They, They walked together. They hung out. They enjoyed each other. And there was a free flow of communication. Satan immediately questioned and attacked God's Word. Because he knew if there was no communication, man couldn't know God, and man was created to what? Know God and have fellowship with Him. So Satan, from the very beginning, came and and intervened in that communication, and then when sin entered 
the world that communication has always been an issue. And so God has communicated in various ways throughout the history of man to man. He's communicated through his prophets. He communicated through Moses. He communicated through the law. And the whole deal was God trying to reveal himself to man. But there's always these barriers, right? There's always these restrictions. So before we get into the study, I just want to ask you, how's God communication in your life? I'd like to ask you what role God's Word plays in your life. See, what happens is, if, if God's Word is not the central focus in which we build our life upon, which God's Word obviously points to Jesus Christ, then what are we doing? What are we really doing? In essence, we're just winging it, right? In essence, we're just kind of making stuff up. We're just kind of doing our own thing or we're looking at other frame of references to try to gain insight or we're listening to all these opinions and all this noise are there a lot of a lot of people talking these days do any of you get tired of social media and hearing everybody's opinion about every thing see that's why this is so important because what it really comes down to is god wants to communicate his heart to mankind the big picture he wants to communicate the fact that we will all stand before Him one day. For what? To give a, an account for how we responded to His communication. So we see something like that video. It gives us an example. I know maybe many of you are like that. It gives us an example of what life looks like when we just do it our own way. That may be not your total thing, but we can suffice to say that if if we don't build our life on the truth, then we're building out on a lie. So we have this battle. We have a battle in the context of our world, in the context of the country we live in. It's it's a battle for truth. It's a battle for lives and for souls. And through all that, we have God saying, He's saying, I want to communicate to you. Pastor Don just pretty much dismantled any possibility of anybody reasonably wanting to know God, thinking that the Bible is just man-made or made up by things. Did you know inherent within the Bible is clues and contexts which... God speaks to us about the divinity of the Bible that woven into the Bible, we have to know that it can't be written by men. If you read through the Bible, you know that that really can't be possible, right? It's just guys made up stuff and just wrote it and just compiled all these books together and somehow there's this constant thread that runs through exactly perfectly. Like nobody would really intellectually honestly think that that could be possible. So like Pastor Don said, it's a hard issue. But as we look at our text this morning, we're going to see that the discovery of God's Word has always been something that's ebbed and flowed in the world. That we go through times where, where people get back to God's Word and then we go through times where there's decline in God's Word. So this is, this is not unprecedented, unprecedented. This is just sort of part of how the history of man has gone. And so we come to a place in our country and we come to a place in the Scripture where we see sort of these things come together in similar ways. And all through that, we have to know that God is trying to communicate to us right now. God wants us to know what He wants to say. He doesn't want us just to wing it. So notice 
first of all, in verse 8, and that's where we're going to kind of draw the emphasis from this section of Scripture. 2 Kings 22, verse 8. It says, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, here it is, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. You see that? That's pretty stunning, you think about. And I'll, we'll kind of develop this a little bit more. But you, you think about the house of the Lord without the book. The house of the Lord. So they, they were just winging it, weren't they? The context of this was the nation of Israel was split into two. The north, Israel, the south. You guys know? Judah. Judah. And the temple was in the south, in the region of Judah. There was a great decline, a great threatening of the nations by their enemies because their whole orientation to God was off. And they were a people who were to represent God to the world. They were a people that were to bring the understanding and knowledge of God to light through their interaction with God and through how God would take care of them and be with them. So that was the message. So God was trying to communicate to the world through the nation of Israel. Now, as they begin to look around and God had fulfilled so many things in their life and He brought them into the promised land, then they sort of got an eye for the nations around them. Of course, that became more important to them than what God said. And so we see this decline, we see this weakening, we see this separation. And whenever we would see the temple compromise, that would, that would be sort of the, the tipping point, the place where communication of God with the nation and the heart of God in their community wouldn't be important anymore. And that's where we would start to see the dismantling of the nation. So it's all, the temple, of course, it represented what? It represented God's presence. It represented worship. It represented God's way. That's, that's where the people would come together and they would understand God through the sacrifices and they would understand sin and the Ark of the Covenant would be in the Holy of Holies and the, that the presence of God would be there and the high priest would go in and out and serve and uh, offer sacrifices. And, and all these things were telling people about themselves. They, they, they were learning about God. They were learning about worship. And as, as long as they were doing that and celebrating God, enjoying God and understanding their sin and understanding being in a right relationship with God, things were good. But like often happens, neglect of God, neglect of His Word, neglect of His truth sends one into spiritual decay which ultimately affects every other area of our life. So you'll notice then our story starts with Josiah. Now, all the kings in the north were bad. It's a couple kings in the south that were bad. So, during this time, the nation of Israel was split. During this time, they were ruled by kings. And kings had, uh, they had a place of spiritual leadership as well. So they sort of set the tone for the spiritual condition. And so we have this emergence of this guy named Josiah. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. So his father was assassinated. So you have this eight-year-old king. He's, he's a young guy. But in Second Chronicles, it, it tells us that when he was 16 years old, he, he really began to seek the Lord. So this eight-year-old boy then, at the age of... He grew up and at the age of 16, things started to trigger and fire in his mind for some reason. We're not sure exactly all why, but um, he, he got to a place where he started to hunger and thirst. Do you guys know what that's like? Like, I don't know about, about you, but I was kind of like that going through high school. I didn't quite 
put all the dots together. I, I believed in, in God. I believed that there was God, but I just didn't quite know how that all worked out. But there was, there was a hunger there. There was a desire there. And God, it's interesting, God is, is a God who constantly is reaching out to us. Constantly desiring that we come to Him. Josiah, he got to that point. And his relationship with God at 16 then started to develop where as a king, then he, he understood that he was to get rid of some bad stuff. Some idols. So he started these reforms. So you have this, this young king who has a moral compass, believes in God, and yet his understanding now is he wants to restore things. He wants to get things back to maybe how they were with David. So notice what it says. It says he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2, it says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in all the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or the left hand. So what we have here, we have a, a picture of a guy who is hungry, but was living on leftovers. He was living on the revelations of the past. He was living on his understanding of David and what he did. And he wanted and understood the moral responsibilities that come from walking with the Lord and and he he just knew of things and he was trying to align himself up with some of those things that he knew and he wanted to be good before God but here's the thing he didn't quite understand fully and totally how to worship God there was a spiritual famine because of the breakdown of the temple. We have a guy who is hungry for more, hungry for God to communicate, a guy who wanted to do the right thing and did the right thing as much as he knew how to do the right thing. But see, what's so important and the difference in the Word of God, one of the differences in the Word of God that we have than just self-help books or a how-to book is that God's Word is living. It's alive. That God reveals His truth to us in a living and active way and a powerful way. And He feeds us. He feeds our soul through the Word. So the Word is not just something that we read and understand in our mind but it's food that builds us up. It's revelation of God's truth. It's empowerment to do what God has called us to do. And therein, that becomes the thrill, one of the thrills of being a Christian. Isn't it discovery? Have you ever read through your Bible and you just things just pop out and you're like, wow! Doesn't the Bible say without... Revelation, what people perish. That just means without the communication of God in a new and a live way. It's easy just to run on fumes, isn't it? Maybe some of you here are just kind of running on fumes. Like, you know the Christian thing. You know the Christian doctrine. You know how things work. And you go to church. But is God speaking to you now? Are you excited about His communication in your life, is He showing you more of Himself? See, that's the romance of Christianity. It's the unveiling of God to a human heart in a continual way that keeps us in awe of Him. See, we're not asked to just follow a code. We're not asked to just follow some instructions or build a life based on morals. But, but God wants to communicate to us have you ever taken time to think about what that means? That the God of the universe actually wants to communicate to us? Wants to speak? Wants to show more of Himself to us? Wants to fill us spiritually? Strengthen us? You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews at the end of chapter 5, it says, if we don't grow from milk, meaning just a very simple, basic understanding 
of the things of the Bible into meat, what happens? One of the things that happens is we're not able to discern the difference between good and evil. Do you think we need to know that today? Do you think it gets harder and harder to, to distinguish what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, and, and we get a lot of proponents of certain things, and you wonder, where's that in the Bible? It's so important that you and I, in the story, that we see our need to be filled and built up with God's Word, strengthened, and the dynamic of God communicating to us constantly through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. So there was a spiritual famine, although he wanted to do the right thing. Notice what happens next. If you go down to verse 4. So his idea now, he, he understands, I want to get this temple rebuilt. And so in verse 4, it says, he tells his, his servants, or I'm sorry, he tells his scribe, he says, go up to Hilkiah the high priest. The high priest was in the temple, sort of watching all this rebuilding take place. And says, go to him and, and have him count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. So now now there's a thing going on there. So now there's some repairs of the temple and there's activity, there's work, people are bringing money, they're seeing the importance of this temple being built. And watch this, in verse 5, he says, the king says, go tell, go, go tell the high priest... When you collect this money, he says, let them deliver it into the hands of those doing the work, the ones who are the overseers of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work, notice, to repair the damages of the house. The house had fallen into ill repair. God's house, the center of worship. In verse 6, it says, the carpenters, the builders, the masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, you don't need to make an accounting of them about the money because they deal faithfully. Now notice here, the second point, as they're, as they're working and they're building, there's still something missing. These were unrepentant repairs. So we're, we're in a spiritual famine, so to speak, and, and there's this one king. God has a little spark, and he, he just wants to do something right, and so he's doing what he can. And his, his efforts are a start, and it's good, and he, he wants to bring back worship. But, but you notice is they're putting things together, and he talks about repairing the, the damages in the house of the Lord that, that these, these were unrepentant repairs. You know what that means? That means a lot of times in our Christian life, we're not really dealing with God. We're just going on continuing to build things that may not even be what God wants. David wanted to build the temple, right? God said, no, not you. But how many of us may be like David and just say, well, I'm going to keep doing it. What I, what I mean by that is maybe we're doing Christian stuff. Maybe we're doing a lot of Christian activity. But yet maybe in our life that we haven't dealt with something. There, there are walls broken down. There are places in our life that we've been disobedient to God or we have issues with people that we've become accustomed to and have become comfortable with and, and are okay with and accepted when God is saying you must repent. See, we can't just keep going on building stuff when there's really issues in our heart because that's not good building material. We can't build on things that are not of the Lord. And we can't kid ourselves and make, make the mistake of, of thinking that I can just keep going headlong and head forward without coming to a place maybe in, in some of our lives where 
where we, we have to reconcile with God. We have to deal with God on, on certain issues. And God has maybe spoken to us about that. And we've denied that, rejected that, ignored that, but we keep building and it makes us feel good. Well, I'm building. I have work. All this stuff's going on. There's, there's a lot of hammering. There's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of cutting. I'm serving. Look at all this stuff. And yet, God keeps speaking to us about these issues. And a lot of times, the more we're trying to cover up the issues, the louder we work. Because remember, it's all about God communicating with us. And maybe God is just whispering to us. And He say, hey, you know that's not right. And you're trying to repair things in your own flesh and your own strength. You're trying to make things right by your dead works. And there's only one answer to your problem. We see that next. So not only was there a spiritual famine and that there was unrepentant repair, which is misguided efforts, look what happens next. So now, we get to the text that we started. So, Hilkiah the high priest, he's the guy in the, in the temple and overseeing all this work. He said the Shaphan, the scribe, the guy that was sent by the king to give the message about the money. He said, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. I just find that so interesting. So ironic. You think, in the house of the Lord, they lost the communication of the Lord. Isn't that that astounding? They were to keep a copy right next to the Ark of the Covenant. And then the, the high priest was to have a copy and the king was to have a copy. And it, no, nobody really knew about it. Nobody knew where it was. It was buried somewhere. Do a lot of times we, we bury Jesus in our church somewhere back there in the closet? We bury God's Word. We live in a culture like that, don't we? The Bible says that, you know, people just, they're just going to go listen to people who are what? Tickle their ears. And so we can cater our church services so that people keep coming, and yet it's not even a thing that God's doing. But if people come, it makes us feel good, right? People are coming, and they're happy, and they're looking at all the stuff we built, and they're saying, wow, look what, look what God did. And God said, I'm not even there. I'm not even around. I'm buried back in the closet somewhere. Why are we so afraid of God's Word? Why are, why are we afraid to teach God's Word? Could it be because we think, well, maybe people won't come. People don't want to hear that anymore. Have we bowed down more to society than to God? That's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem. That's an attack of Satan. Because God's Word is the revealing of God to us. And so, so they, they found the book, but they didn't know what to do with it. You notice that? It, we found this, they just say this, this book. We just found this, this book. They weren't quite sure what they had in their hands. They weren't quite sure the treasure that they had. I was kind of like that. You know, you kind of read the Bible when, when you're like younger and you start in, in Genesis and you get to Leviticus and you're pretty much out. You're, that's a, you're like, I just don't get this. this. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. It's hard. To, it's a lot of weird stuff in there. But you know what happened? It, I got saved at 16 years old. I gave my life to Christ. And you know how it happened? It, it was it was because this guy he began to share the word with me. Before that, all I had to go by was you know I kind of I believed in God and I would look around and see people who went to church and I realized I don't I didn't want to be like them. They became the communication 
of God to me, the only thing I had. I said, I didn't want to be like them. And they didn't have any appeal. But this one guy, he started sharing the Bible. And I was, I was like, wow, that's really in there? That's really in there? And I got excited. And it, you know what I, he, I know now? He took me through the Romans road. He basically put in perspective the things that I was feeling in my heart, but I, I couldn't put it all together. And he, he showed me that in my current state, my current condition, I was not forgiven of my sins. That, that was something surprising. I thought, well, I'm a good person. Why did I think that? I didn't know the Bible. I didn't, my frame of reference was those people that went to church. And I pretty, I was morally just as good, maybe better than them at that time. But I didn't understand. He started showing me, the Bible says, hey, everybody sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whoa. What does that mean? I'm a sinner. Wow. Nobody ever told me that before. I just thought, you know, you, you're a good person. You go to, church you believe in god everything's cool he's a no you're a sinner really wow well what happens to people like me well the wages of sin is death he said sin's a killer like oh wow that's scary what do you mean or you mean hell well wages of sin is death. Yes, that's what it means. Oh, man. But, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Whoa. Okay. So, I'm not a good person. I'm in trouble. All of Scripture speaks against my current condition. What do I do? Well, Jesus died for you. He actually took your place. He paid the penalty. Do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ right now? Yeah. And I didn't understand all of it. And, and I wasn't weeping over my sin. I be honest with you, I just didn't want to go to hell. And I believe what he was saying was true. And I saw it. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. But you know, the thing that happened was I started to go to church with him. And I went every Sunday. And they sort of had a really nice topical type of message. But I never grew. Uh, immature Christian going into college is not a pretty picture. So I just got hammered. And to be honest with you, a lot of stuff I was just kind of naive to. I didn't really fully know the stuff I was doing, how bad it was or anything. I didn't really think about it. But I felt conviction in my heart until one day I just got sick of that. And I said, Lord... I don't want to live like this anymore. I give you my whole life. Just do whatever you want. I don't care anymore. And you know what happened? Once I cut the cord like that, God began to direct me to what I needed in order to grow and be grounded. And you know what happened? Just by happenstance, I'm driving in a car and on the radio came across K-Wave, which is the station in California, and I started hearing Bible teaching. I started hearing Calvary Chapel guys just teach the Word. And I couldn't believe it. I I was like, wow, churches actually do that? I couldn't believe what I was... I was just... I couldn't get enough of it. The Word became alive. And I began to seek out places. These Calvary Chapel... I couldn't believe they were right in my backyard, so I'd start going. I'd listen, I'd go. And I grew more in my relationship with the Lord in those six months I did in six years previous being Christian. It's never been different. It's since that time, the Word of God has just been like that. Sure, there's ebb and flows, but the Word of God has is, is now become so important. It's become a treasure. That's what we see unfolding here. So he says again in, verse, in the bottom half of verse 8, Hilkiah gave it to Shaphat and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe, he went back to the king and he brought the word and and he said, your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house. So he didn't even tell them right off the bat, I found the word. He's like, well, here's, here's, you know, I communicated your message, they got it. But 
There's just one little thing. It says in verse 10, Shaph and the scribe showed the king saying, Hey, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And then Shaphan read it before the king. What a day, huh? What, a, what an amazing day when they discover the book. But you know what this speaks of too? Is the preservation of God's Word. And how God has preserved it. They found the book. So they, they found the book. They didn't know what to do with it. It's a communication of God. It's, it's what the whole nation needs to be right with God. To find their glory in the Lord. And to prevent the horrible atrocities that were happening. They've neglected it for years and now they have it. The treasure of life is right in front of them. And he reads it to the king. And what is the response? Look in verse 11. It happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. You would maybe think that he would hear it and be happy and rejoice. There would be glee. He freaked out. Because the book told him something that he didn't know. It brought his situation to light, his circumstances, the things that were going on. It explained all of that. And this this guy who was hungering for the right thing, the guy who was wanting to bring back God into the community and doing the best he can, running on fumes at this moment was completely undone. Because in that word, he read about the judgment of God. And no doubt, we can come into God's word and it speaks about our condition. Perhaps that's why many don't like to read God's word. But it takes an honest assessment of ourself, which normally doesn't come from ourself. Normally, we're not very objective in regards to our own life. And here comes the word, and it speaks of our desperate condition before God. It shows us of our need, it reveals the sinfulness of our heart. It it points out how desperate we need a Savior. And so that was his reaction. It was it was like we're in trouble. He tore his clothes as a, a sign of grief and anguish. And he realizes I need help. Now watch this. This is so important. In verse 13. His response is okay we need to find out exactly. We need the application of what this is all about. We're not sure exactly what he's reading, but he's probably reading in Deuteronomy where it, it talked about the conditional promise God had to the nation of Israel and how if they were hold up to hold up their bargain, God would hold up His bargain. God set before them blessings and cursings and, and they choose that which one they would do by their obedience to the Lord. So he says, go inquire... Verse 13, go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And so what seems so awful is really, this is the beginning. That now there's clarity. The book has brought clarity to the king's situation, to Josiah's situation. And remember, Josiah was doing everything right in the sight of the Lord. He wasn't looking to the left nor looking to the right. He was the one few good kings, but yet he was still undone by what he saw in this book. And his response was just brokenness over it. And that's really important. Because it's really easy when God communicates to us to ignore it, harden our heart towards it, to block it out, to think some way we will escape it, to think it's not important for us, to think that only applies to those people back then. When all the meanwhile, God is requiring a response from us. 
that's really the issue is he's communicating because his desire is to bring us into a right relationship with him. So then his communication falls back on us and we say, well, what are we going to do with that? And that's then the crucial area of what we do with God's communication. The right response is to receive what he says and respond to it. So his brokenness before the Lord starts with repentance. So now he, he's, he's turning, but my final point, you'll watch this. So he's, he goes and he sends his servants to inquire, to find out about this whole thing. And watch this. So they go to this prophetess in verse 14, Holda, the prophetess. And look in verse 16. Here's her conclusion of the matter. Remember, God's communicating. Watch what she says. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and its inhabitants. God said that then. God's saying that now too, right? We, we sit on the precipice of what the Bible calls a great day of wrath, don't we? The Bible speaks about the time where, where God will deliver the worldwide church, the universal body of Christ, believers across the world, they will be caught up in the air, which will then start a seven-year period of tribulation on the earth like it's never been seen before. So God has said that. He's communicated to that. So what's, what's our response to that? So let's put that in context, right? So here, Josiah is going to find out there's going to be judgment. We're sitting here, 2014, we have our Bibles, and God says there is also going to be a day coming. That God said that in the past, and He's fulfilled it all exactly how He's done it. And now we sit where He's going to do that in the future. And... We have all these pieces coming into place that have been told to us of how it's going to look, how it's going to work, what it's going to be like, and we have all those things put into place now. So with God communicating that to us, how do we respond to that? Are we like, the Bible says, it'll be like in the days of Noah where they're eating and marrying and drinking and, and carrying on as if it's not going to happen? Or are we taking God's word seriously? So we can see how easy it is for people in their day to ignore the word because if you can ignore God's word and his truth with all the things happening now in our world, then that puts us in the same boat, doesn't it? So he says, I'm going to bring this calamity. Look at verse 17. He says, because they have forsaken me and burn incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the, the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. So you know what happens? Here's what always happens. When we remove God's Word, we create a vacuum that brings in all sorts of idols. brings false teachings. It brings philosophies of the world. And we have to ask ourselves right now, what are we really building our life on? And so we push the Word of God aside. There's a vacuum there. And that's what happened. They put the Word of God aside and the worship of God through the temple. In that vacuum came all sorts of crazy idols into the nation of Israel. And that's one of the things that Josiah went about correcting is getting rid of all those things. We too, if not looking to God's Word, will have a slew full of idols in our life, things that we too worship. And as we push God's Word aside, you can bet in comes all these unwelcome visitors 
to solicit us. And you can see that the challenge to the Word of God today is very difficult because of all the comp- competing factors. It's, it's harder for people to sit and to have attention span and it's harder to siphon through all the different people's opinions and things. And, and God says, just come to a place where you just get back to My Word. Just put all that aside and just come back to My Word. And boy, it is really refreshing to come to that place and to take God's Word and just sit and be quiet before it, interact with God before that. And, and I pray that that is your delight. If not, I pray it becomes your delight. But let's just finish with this, this response. Look in verse 19. So all this stuff's going on. Judgment's coming. The people, even though they're repairing the temple, their efforts are misguided. And here's, look at verse 19. He says, or the prophetess says, because your heart was tender. Might want to circle that. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants. See, regardless of what's going on, it doesn't have to go on with us. You see that? And the key is our sensitivity and response to what God says. Instead of pushing back to the, uh, to the truth, we humble ourselves tenderly before God and we let God's Word transform us and mold us. And that can't happen if we keep inserting our will and our ways and our ideas and our opinions. At some point, we have to simply come before the Lord and say, Lord, Your will be done. Letting God's Word transform us. He says, because of Your humility, Your tenderness in regards to my communication... He says, I have heard you. Notice that in verse 19, the end. I have heard you. So now the communication's going back, isn't it? You see that? So now God has been communicating. They neglected communication for years. The book has been found and they've, they've realized what's going on and the king is tender before it and now his tenderness before God is communicating a message to God. So now there's interaction. He says, I have heard you. And look at verse 20. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. No matter what goes on around us, our response to God can save us. And we all have a decision to make, really. A response that comes through hearing the Word of God. And I don't know what's going on in your life, where you've been. I don't know what brought you here today. But I can tell you this. God knows God is calling out to you. He's communicating to you. And He wants you to respond to Him. He wants you to respond by faith. He wants you to respond humbly and tenderly. And He wants you to say, Lord, Your will be done. You are the God of truth. You are the God that sets me free. You are the God that lights my path. You are the God who saves and rescues. And Lord, may You now speak to me and may I respond to You appropriately. Will You join me in prayer? Lord, we do thank You for this morning and I thank You for these guys. And I want to just give them an opportunity this morning just to to be sensitive to what You may be saying to them today. I want to... Just pray that You would give them a message or a communication that You'd speak to their heart right now. 
Lord, I pray for for anybody here this morning that if they were to die today, they wouldn't be sure that they would be in heaven. I pray for anybody who's been counting on your charity to go to heaven or counting on their good works to go to heaven or counting on their own morality or righteousness when in reality you have told us the importance of putting our faith in you and not in ourselves. So Lord, I want to pray for anybody here this morning who may be in that condition has never received your salvation and who would say today I just I want to know that I'm going to heaven I want to know that when I die I'll be in, ter- in eternity with Jesus I want to know that and the Bible says that I've written these things so that you may know that you have eternal life And so we we come to that place like I did when I was 16 where the Bible is very clear. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And that all of us are sinners that need a Savior to do what we could not do. And so if you're here and you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that right now, right here, right in your seat, very simply. By recognizing the fact that you're a sinner and can do nothing about it, and turning from your sin to Jesus, and asking for His forgiveness. And if you sincerely mean that, and want that, the Bible promises that you will be forgiven. And you can do it like this. I'm going to say a simple prayer, and you can just say it after me. The prayer doesn't save you. It's your communication of God to God that you want to be saved. You can say something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And Lord Jesus, I now turn from my sin. To you, and I put my faith in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I receive that now. I ask you to wash me clean and accept me on the basis of Jesus Christ. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk with you. The Bible says if you if you prayed that and meant that, that your heart desires that, you, you are saved just like that. And I just want to say a prayer before we move on. I want to say a prayer for anybody else here today. You may just be in a place of discouragement, frustration, place where the word has become maybe dull or boring or has has a place somewhere in the back room or is gathering dust that this the word is drudgery i want to pray pray for you today is for a fresh filling of the holy spirit that god's word would be new and fresh and your relationship with Him would be new and fresh and that whatever issue you may be dealing with and maybe today you're one of those ones that's doing a lot of stuff but in reality you just need to repent. just want to give you a second right now to do that to just basically get your life right with God. As we saw at the end of that story that's what the whole thing comes down to just being rightly oriented to God and fellowship walking with Him. So I'm going to just wait for like 30 seconds and this is a time just for you and God to do business and see what He says.